Today we will reflect on this question. Did the good Roman emperor and stoic philosopher Marcus Aurelius actively persecute the Christians? Why wasn't Marcus Aurelius and other Stoics impressed by the martyrdom of Christians in the arena? How could Marcus Aurelius espouse Christian values in the Stoic meditations while also including critical comments criticizing Christianity? Was Emperor Marcus Aurelius too committed to paganism to consider Christianity? How much authority did he derive from his position as the chief priest of the Roman Empire? And at the end, did Marcus Aurelius reconcile himself with the Christian faith? Please, we welcome interesting questions in the comments. Let us learn and reflect together. At the end of our talk, we'll discuss the sources used for this video. Please feel free to follow along in the PowerPoint script we uploaded to SlideShare. One of our most popular videos reflected on whether the Roman Emperor Marcus Aurelius persecuted the Christians. On the one hand, we know that there were vigorous local persecutions of Christians during his reign, and that St. Justin, a church father and philosopher, was martyred in Rome during his reign. But on the other hand, we have no direct evidence that he personally ordered any persecutions of Christians. Marcus Aurelius was truly a philosopher king that Plato longed for. He wrote the famous Stoic tract, The Meditations. Many of his writings in his meditations remind us of New Testament teachings in particular. Love of one's neighbor and truth and modesty are a property of the rational soul. Unfortunately, another passage in his meditation seems to confirm that Marcus Aurelius did witness Christians being martyred in the arena. His meditations declare, what a great soul is that which is ready to be separated from the body and then to be extinguished or dispersed or continue to exist. But this readiness must come from a man's own judgment, not from mere obstinacy, as with the Christians, but considerately and with dignity and in a way not to persuade another without a tragic show. Now, probably this was a criticism of the more fanatical Christians who actively sought martyrdom by pestering and loudly objecting to local magistrates that they would not sacrifice to the gods, behavior which was also discouraged by many bishops. Oddly enough, immediately after this is when Marcus Aurelius urges us at some length how we should love our neighbor, even when our neighbor wants to be our enemy. The modern historian Henry Chadwick notes that Marcus Aurelius regarded suicide as ethically unobjectionable but felt that it must be done in good style, not like the Christians in a spirit of theatricality. And he's rephrasing the above quote from Meditations. Now I demur. This quote does not explicitly mention suicide, although it does repeat the Stoic and Greek concern that one should both live a good life and die a good death. And there's at least one scholar that argues the opposite point, that the reference to Christians was a later addition, but not many scholars agree with that position. Walter Kaufman, in his introduction of the meditations, put it this way, a man who for reasons of state possibly sanctioned the persecutions of Christians achieved a genuinely Christian depth of humility. In the words of Matthew Arnold, what an affinity for Christianity had this persecutor of Christians. The effusion of Christianity, its relieving tears, its happy self-sacrifice, were the very element one feels for which his soul longed. They were near him, they brushed him, he touched them by, and he passed them by. The Meditations also criticize the Christian doctrine of the resurrection of the soul. If souls continue to exist, how does the air contain them from eternity? He then speculates that souls eventually diffuse to make room for other souls. His Meditations also criticizes the Christian doctrine of the resurrection of the body. We must not only think of some bodies that are buried, but also the animals that are eaten by us and the other animals. For these animals that are consumed are also buried in the bodies of those men who feed on them. Interestingly, when St. Paul preaches to the Athenians in Acts 17, it is the doctrine of the resurrection of the dead that the Greeks have trouble accepting. There is limited persecutions of Christians in New Testament times at the insistence of certain Jewish leaders, but Emperor Nero was the first emperor to persecute the Christians in Rome. A large portion of Rome was destroyed in a large fire, and since many blamed him for clearing space for a new palace, Nero instead made Christians the scapegoats martyring them both in the arena and as living torches in his gardens during his parties. Nero also murdered many senators. Eventually he lost all support, was abandoned by the Praetorian Guard, and was compelled to commit suicide. Vespasian, the fourth emperor in the year after Nero expired, did not actively persecute Christians, and neither did his older son and successor Titus. But his younger son, Domitian, 
who succeeded Titus as emperor, insisted that Jews and Christians view him as master in God, which resulted in empire-wide spotty persecutions. Domitian was assassinated, and there were few persecutions of any under his successor and the first of the five good Roman emperors, Nerva, who reigned only 18 months. His successor, Trajan, eased up on the persecutions as he did not like his cult becoming a compulsory test of loyalty. The Roman Empire reached its greatest extent under the conquests of Trajan. His successor, Hadrian, thought these far-flung borders were indefensible. He withdrew from Armenia and several other provinces and concentrated on consolidating the empire, visiting each province, binding the empire closer together. His successor, Antoninus Pius, was an old man when he became emperor. He ruled from Rome. He was a former senator. He was neither a general nor a traveler. However, persecutions did not cease under Trajan. During this time, St. Ignatius of Antioch was famously martyred in Rome writing epistles to and visiting with members of several churches on his journey, most of which survive to this day. Under Trajan, the policy was set that if someone was accused of being a Christian, they would be freed if they burned incense to the gods and the emperor's statutes, and denounced Christ. But Christians were not to be actively sought out, and informers could not be anonymous. The degree of persecution and the strictness of the proceedings differed among the provinces, Many local governors were not eager to persecute the local Christians. The plight of the Christians improved under the next good emperors, Hadrian and Antoninus Pius. We reflected on the history of Christian persecutions using the ancient church historian Eusebius and his ecclesiastical history as a main source to determine the extent of Christian persecution through the reign of Marcus Aurelius. We also reflected on the history of the Roman emperors preceding Marcus Aurelius. Now, since the Christian persecutions were not systematic, many Christian intellectuals wrote apologies defending Christianity, seeking both to encourage future Christian martyrs and to convert the emperor so they would halt the persecutions, or so they hoped. The two main apologists were St. Justin the Martyr and Tertullian. They had opposite attitudes to pagan philosophy. Justin saw Christianity as a summation of man's search for truth and he was widely read in philosophy and said that Platonism helped lead him to Christianity. Justin interpreted the Old Testament primarily in a Christocentric manner, and one of his students was Tatian. On the other hand, Tertullian was hostile to pagan learning. He famously asked, what does Athens have to do with Jerusalem? He was one of the first church fathers to write in Latin rather than Greek, and was famous for many other aphorisms. When explaining why God would reveal himself in a crucified and resurrected Christ, he proclaimed, I believe it precisely because it is absurd, and we plan to reflect on Tertullian's writing sometime in the future. The anti-Christian apologists in descending order of hostility were Celsus, Porphyry, and Galen. Celsus wrote the diatribe, The True Word, before 180 AD. Likely Marcus Aurelius was familiar with this work. Many years later, the Christian theologian Origen would pen the lengthy Contra Celsus, where he responds to his learned criticisms of Christianity point by point. Celsus was more familiar with actual Christian doctrine than preceding pagan critics. The modern biographer McLean notes that how Celsus contrasts Christianity and Judaism, criticizing Christianity. And he quotes Celsus, The Christians claim that they are the proper realization of Judaism while rejecting core Jewish customs and laws on circumcision, diet, festivals, and keeping the Sabbath. They cannot have it both ways. Either they are a new sect with no relations to Judaism, or they are a cousin of the Jewish faith, in which case they are not entitled to take a pick-and-mix approach to its doctrines. McLean continues with the summary of Celsus' views. Judaism was a nationalist sect with no claims to universality, but Christianity claimed to be a world religion. It was thus both implicitly and explicitly a threat to the Roman Empire and the social stability in general, implicitly because of its dogmas and explicitly because it proselytized. Judaism was compatible with paganism since both practiced sacrifice. Christianity emphatically was not. Although he mostly combated heresy in his writings, since there are no major persecutions that he faced, we must credit St. Irenaeus, along with St. Justin the Martyr, for coining many of the terms that Christians use to describe their faith, whether they be Protestant, Catholic, or Orthodox. Now we'll review the biography of Marcus Aurelius. The five good Roman emperors, Nerva, Trajan, Hadrian, Antoninus Pius, and finally Marcus Aurelius, were good because they did not inherit the throne. Nerva was elected by the Senate after the execution of Domitian. 
General Hadrian succeeded Trajan when he died during a military campaign, while the other three were adopted by their predecessor as being amply qualified to be emperor. Marcus Aurelius praised Antoninus Pius for his many Stoic virtues in his meditations. Hadrian adopted Antoninus Pius and insisted that he in turn adopt Marcus Aurelius, ensuring secure successions for both of them. Hadrian hired many Stoic and scholarly tutors for young Marcus, who strove to live an ascetic Stoic life even as a boy of twelve. Marcus was elected consul and assumed many responsibilities as Antoninus Pius' health declined in his final years. Now Marcus Aurelius faced more challenges as emperor than any of the other good Roman emperors preceding him. These challenges included major flooding of the Tiber River in Rome, invasion of Armenia and the eastern provinces by Parthia in Persia, and the Antoninian plague that killed 10% of the population and the rebellion of the Germanic tribesmen who invaded North Italy. No sooner had Marcus Aurelius overcame these problems than his favorite general in the east, Vidius Cassius, revolted, and he was encouraged by the empress and wife of Marcus Aurelius, Faustina. Initially, they were responding to rumors that Marcus had died, but the rebellion continued after the rumors proved false. Both died under mysterious circumstances. In explaining why Marcus Aurelius was loath to ruthlessly punish those who allied themselves with the general Avidius Cassius when he raised a revolt, the ancient Roman historian Cassius Dio says this, Marcus indeed was so averse to bloodshed that he even used to watch the gladiators in Rome contend like athletes without risking their lives, for he never gave any of them a sharp weapon, but they all fought with blunted weapons like foils furnished with buttons. Marcus Aurelius was a practicing Stoic during his reign as emperor when many crises confronted him. He ate simply and did not display his wealth ostentatiously, and he did not host debauched and elaborate banquets, although he did not shy away from the necessary cruelties compelled by the bitter Marco-Manic wars against the Germanic tribesmen. He was ready to forgive shortcomings during these wars when reigning as emperor, and even after the half-hearted coup attempt against him. After the coup, he proclaimed that there would be no death penalties facing those who became entangled in this coup attempt. The efforts of Marcus Aurelius were wasted when his son Commodus succeeded him as emperor. He was as cruel and despicable an emperor as Nero, and like Nero, he was assassinated by a conspiracy of the Praetorian Guards and Senators. And like Nero, his rule was followed by another year of five emperors before the Roman Empire stabilized somewhat. Unlike Nero, Commodus tolerated Christians. He did not actively persecute them. Why did the Christian persecutions increase under the reign of Marcus Aurelius? They were quite likely aggravated by the stresses facing the empire, the floods, the plagues, and the rebellions in Parthia and Germania. In pagan societies, you bribed the gods with sacrifices and occasional public prayer so they would not do you any harm, and to protect the community from disasters. Many pagans felt that even if just a few in the community did not do their civic duties and offer sacrifices, the gods would be angry and withhold their favor. Many blamed the troubles the empire was facing on the Christians. Now previously I speculated that one reason why there were persecutions in Rome during the reign of Marcus Aurelius was that he was distracted fighting the Germanic tribes. Now unfortunately we learned in the last years of Pius' reign and in the early years of his reign, Marcus ruled in Rome for several decades. And the famous persecution of Bishop Polycarp happened in Asia Minor under the reign of Marcus Aurelius, as did a local persecution in North Africa and other places. But an especially vicious, systematic, and persevering persecution erupted in Lyon, now France, then Gaul, when a bloodthirsty governor martyred nearly every Christian in two dioceses. And this was possibly the only systematic persecution in the entire history of the Roman Empire. Henry Chadwick and the influential history of the early church says that with certainty Marcus Aurelius ordered the persecution of Christians in Gaul, writing that the emperor Marcus Aurelius directed that the Christians should be tortured to death and no refinement of cruelty was spared. But other scholars doubt that Marcus Aurelius ordered these local persecutions, although eventually he likely became aware of them. St. Justin Martyr had written an apology addressed to the Senate and another apology was addressed to Pius and Marcus. In Rome, St. Justin founded a school for philosophers. He challenged the Cynic pagan philosopher Crescens to a debate. Justin won the debate, but Crescens turned him in for martyrdom. The judge was a former tutor and friend of Marcus, so Marcus must have been aware of this persecution. 
what were Marcus Aurelius's policy towards the Christians? McLean has these observations, which were in response to the challenges faced by the empire, the plague, the plating of the Tiber, and two unwanted military conflicts. Early in his reign, he issued a decree mandating the worship of the Olympian gods, which was not likely directed at the minuscule Christian sect. Another decree ordered exile to an island for anyone who tried to invoke the terror of the gods, which Tertullian mentions. There is less conclusive evidence that he encouraged provincial governors to vigorously enforce the law against treasonable acts. How committed was Marcus Aurelius to the worship of the gods, and how much contact did he have with Christians? Marcus Aurelius served as chief priest from an early age. This was part of his civic duty and solidified his position of emperor. If he had abandoned this priesthood, he likely would have lost his authority as emperor. While in Greece, Marcus and his son Commodus were initiated into the Eleusian Mysteries, the esoteric ritual that possibly included a trance induced by psychedelic drugs, and included sacred objects like a mystical serpent and a holy phallus. Supposedly, only the pure in heart would be accepted into this cult, which would further bind them to paganism. Pagan priests are not the same as Christian priests, as this was more of a civic duty rather than a religious duty. Pagans typically did not pray to pagan gods out of love for the gods, as the gods were distant from ordinary people. You might pray that the pagan gods will bless you or your crops, or you might pray to the Greek demigod Asclepius for healing, but mostly you sacrifice to the gods so they won't do you any harm. Or you might visit an oracle to ask for guidance from the gods. Did Marcus Aurelius really believe that the pagan gods existed? Many educated Romans and most Roman emperors were skeptics, but history suggests that Marcus was not skeptical. He mentions various gods more often than the other Stoic philosophers although most of his reference are either to God or to Zeus, like the other Stoics. And his coins often depict the various gods, unlike the coins of Antoninus that depict historical Roman notables. We also know that he was fond of sacrifices and oracles. His personal physician was the famous Galen, who claimed to have a hotline to the healing god Asclepius. None of his relatives or colleagues favored Christianity, unlike the future first Christian emperor Constantine, whose mother was Christian. We do know that several of his colleagues and government officials did not condone Christianity. Even in his reign, the percentage of the population that was Christian was still small. About 2% of Roman citizens were Christian in 250 AD, so the percentage during the reign of Marcus Aurelius was likely around 1% or less. During his campaigns in Germania, Marcus Aurelius wrote his meditations, establishing him as one of the great Stoic philosophers. Many of his meditations agree with Christian teachings making many Christians in both the modern and ancient world reluctant to accuse him of persecuting Christians. He encouraged the study of philosophy. He funded four chairs of philosophy in Athens, one for Stoics, one for Epicureans, one for Platonists, and another for Aristotelians. Now the columns in Rome celebrating Marcus Aurelius' victory against the Germanic tribesmen depict the rain miracle during the Marcomannic Wars, which is attributed to the pagan gods and the carvings on the columns. Was this a pagan miracle or a Christian miracle? We will compare several sources. The first source is Cassius Dio, a Roman senator who wrote an 80 book history of the Roman Republic and the Roman Empire. Unfortunately, the last 20 books contain only fragments and the meager abridgment of John Zephilinus, a Byzantine monk from the 11th century. This tends to be more complete for the last years of Marcus Aurelius' reign. Cassius Dio states that the Quadi, a Germanic tribe, had surrounded and outnumbered the Romans. At a favorable spot, as the Romans were fighting valiantly with their shields locked together, the barbarians ceased fighting, expecting to capture them easily as the result of the heat in their thirst. So they posted the gods and hemmed them in to prevent them from getting water from anywhere. And Cassius Dio continues, the Romans accordingly were in a terrible plight from fatigue, wounds, the heat of the sun, and thirst, so they could neither fight nor retreat, but were scorched by the heat when suddenly many clouds gathered in a mighty rain, not without divine interposition, burst upon them. And there is a story that an Egyptian magician, who was a companion of Marcus, had invoked the rain by means of enchantments by various deities, and in particular Mercury, the god of the air, and by this means attracted the rain. Now Zephylinus interjects, this is what Dio says about the matter, but he is apparently in error, whether intentionally or otherwise. Yet I am inclined to believe that his error was chiefly intentional. And as a preface to this comment, I would like to point out that during the Marcomannic Wars, as a result of the plague, 
The Roman Empire relaxed their recruiting standards for soldiers, so it is reasonable that they would induct many Christians. Marcus Aurelius's prefect approached him and told him that those who were called Christians could accomplish anything whatever by their prayers, and that in the army there chanced to be a whole division of this sect. Marcus, on hearing this, appealed to them to pray to their god. When they had prayed, their god heard and smote the enemy with a violent hailstorm and thunderbolts, while they comforted the Romans with a shower of rain. Water and fire were descending from the sky simultaneously. So while those on the one side were being consumed by fire and dying, while the fire on the other hand did not touch the Romans, but if it fell anywhere among them, it was immediately extinguished. The shower on the other hand did the barbarians no good, but like so much oil actually fed the flames that were consuming them. And they had to search for water even while being drenched with rain. Now, personally, I decline to suspect that our good monk Zephylinus is being duplicitous when he declares that this is what Dio says about the matter. But then, how can you prove such a thing? So, perhaps Cassius Dio did say this was a Christian miracle. After all, something similar happened in battle under Constantine many generations later. And the modern historian Anthony Burley notes that it would be in character for Marcus to have prayed to Zeus during a thunderstorm for a thunderbolt to strike the enemy. So what does Eusebius, the ancient church historian, tell us about this rain miracle? When Marcus Aurelius was battling the German barbarians, his Christian soldiers prayed to God in a thunderbolt struck that drove the enemy to flight and destruction, and the rain that fell revived the Roman army that was on the point of perishing from thirst. And was the Christian rain miracle epistle spurious? Eusebius says that Marcus Aurelius wrote letters stating that in Germany his army was saved from thirst by the Christian's prayers. And Marcus threatened to execute any who attempted to accuse us. Maybe Eusebius is telling us that Marcus Aurelius came to see the light, or maybe that his sources conflict on whether Marcus Aurelius persecuted the Christians. And the epistle credited to Marcus Aurelius is appended to St. Justin the Martyr's first apology to the Roman Senate in the first volume of the Antinicene Church Fathers. This epistle tells us of these Christians and how they began the battle, not by preparing weapons nor arms nor bugles, for such preparation is hateful for them, on account of the God they bear about in their conscience. And immediately when the Christians cast themselves on the ground to pray to their God, refreshingly cool water poured from heaven, but on their enemies felt a fury withering hail. And immediately we recognize the presence of God following this prayer, a God unconquerable and indestructible. Now, even the Protestant scholar compiling this work in the late 1800s footnotes that this epistle is spurious, no doubt, but the literature on the subject is very rich. And modern scholars would no doubt agree with this assessment. But was this epistle indeed spurious? Historians would point out there is no Roman evidence for a change of heart by Marcus Aurelius, other than the possible suggestion of Cassius Dio. However, it does tell us that many early Christians, including Eusebius, wanted to believe that this epistle for Marcus Aurelius was authentic. But there is enough confusion among the ancient historical accounts that modern Christians, in addition to ancient Christians, can indeed hope that Marcus Aurelius saw the light of salvation in his last days. Did Marcus Aurelius actively persecute the Christians? Since our good emperor did not enjoy the bloody gladiatorial contests and took steps to tamp them down, and since history provides little evidence to prove his active participation, it makes sense to say that he did not. But his quotes and his meditations and other evidence provide a strong argument that he tolerated the persecution of Christians in Rome and elsewhere. And now we'll discuss the sources we use for this video. Anthony McGuckin has written a remarkable history of the first millennium of the Christian faith, and he has a long chapter devoted to the Christian persecutions. McGuckin discusses the mystery cults such as Mithras and Cybele, and also Manichaeism, discussing whether they paved the way for Christianity, but we just did not discuss this. The modern historian Frank McLean, in his biography of Marcus Aurelius, has a great deal of background information on the Christian persecutions both in the reigns of Marcus Aurelius and the previous emperors. Anthony Burley, another modern biographer of Marcus Aurelius, also discusses the persecutions, and in addition has an excellent discussion on the historical sources of the Christian persecutions. And the most important source of all, Marcus Aurelius' meditations. And this collection of Stoic aphorisms is very readable. Another critical ancient source is the History of the Church by Eusebius, also known as Ecclesiastical History and he is a church historian who lived during the reign of Emperor Constantine. There are some historical inaccuracies that are found in most ancient historical documents, including Eusebius, but they don't detract from the story. 
His quotes reveal the mindsets of ancient Christian leaders. We always consult Henry Chadwick on the history of the early church. He always has interesting points. And also in the video on the biographies of Marcus Aurelius, we discuss the sources in more in depth, including the discussion by Anthony Burley of the ancient sources available for Marcus Aurelius. The YouTube description includes a link to our PowerPoint script that we uploaded to SlideShare and also our blog. Please support this channel by sharing this video with your friends and by clicking on the like and subscribe buttons and by clicking on the Amazon links to purchase any of the books we discussed, which will earn us a very small affiliate commission. And please consider becoming a patron of our channel. Plus, we will host special discussion groups for our patrons. Plus, you can click on the meetup or small M icon to participate in our online discussions where we practice our future YouTube scripts. And please click on the links for other videos that will broaden your knowledge and improve your soul.